welcome. It is good to be together this afternoon. It takes enormous strength to come. We each come with sorrows, griefs of varying kinds, but we are here together, and this is a safe place where we can be real, we can be honest, and we can trust that God will meet us here. I want to let you know a couple of housekeeping things. We are so very blessed to have the Reverend Suze McIver with us this afternoon to bring our meditation. Suze has been doing hospice ministry and before that pastoral ministry for many, many years, and she has a tremendous heart for the grieving. We're also blessed that several of our congregational care ministers are able to be involved in our service this afternoon, and these are lay people who are called and trained to extend the ministry of the pastoral staff, and so you'll get to see them, you'll get to hear Sue's, and of course, we're blessed to have the music team here, and Jeff and Ben and I. So now, will you join me? In our opening prayer. God of abundant mercy, you have given us grace to pray with one heart and one voice, even though our hearts are broken and our voices tremble with grief and sorrow. Comfort, comfort, Lord, your holy people. Comfort those of us who sit in darkness, mourning neath our sorrow's load. Speak to us of the peace that awaits us, of the balm of healing for our weary and wounded souls. We ask all of this, trusting in the promise you have made to hear the prayers of two or three who have gathered. In the name of your holy child, Jesus. Amen.
By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked us for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good afternoon. I was a little tiny baby when we moved into that house that was surrounded by endless wheat fields. I had ballerina wallpaper in my bedroom, and the thresholds of that house were made of hard oak. And I can remember as a toddler, I liked to place my two feet on that lifted piece of wood and put my hands out on the door jams and move back and forth and front and back. It was my own little balance beam of sorts. It was a great opportunity to, to feel about that much taller and a lot stronger and a lot older. But as we mature, the thresholds that we experience, especially that threshold of grief, is not much fun. Neither in nor out, grief is a sort of waiting period, a sort of waiting time between what we know to be true, that historical reality that we have, and what is yet to be known. And many of us struggle with the threshold of grief. It causes us so much anguish. We say things like, I feel so sad. A piece of my heart is gone. I don't know how I can move forward. Our text today reminds us that the Hebrew people were also grief-stricken. They were standing on a threshold of sorts, a threshold of what they knew to be true and what was yet to come. Driven from their native country, they are in a strange land, wearied and brokenhearted. They long for happy days and those happier memories. They need not look far to be reminded that their homeland and their identity is no more. Well, in grief, we also feel as if we are strangers in a foreign land, as if we've arrived in a place mysterious and peculiar, a place with questions filled with emotional twists and turns, ups and downs, drained and heavy-hearted. We yearn for those good old days as we worry about what is ahead. And just like the children of Israel, neither do we feel like singing. We might also call this time of waiting liminal space. From the Latin word limen, liminal spaces are places in between, places between what was and what will be, places of transition, places of ambiguity that occur when we are stuck right there in the middle. They are holding times that whisper to us somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. And we arrive in a liminal space for any number of reasons a particular event or circumstance interrupts our life, and all of a sudden, everything we know is up in the air. Or maybe something is unfolding, and we have no control over the outcome. Maybe a loved one dies. Maybe there's a car accident. 
maybe a cancer diagnosis, maybe we lose our job. Unexpectedly, we find ourselves face to face with fears about who we are and how we show up and interact in the world. We feel vulnerable and we question the very core of our identity because we are out of sync and it's hard to see out. So today, it's helpful to be reminded that this time of grief matters. It is sacred. It is important. We can choose to struggle and fight and push against our grief. Or we can choose to lean into it and listen to the message it gives us. A message that includes trusting that we will be held and we will be supported in this time. Rabbi Harold Kushner, whose young son died of a tragic disease, writes in a book that I know you've heard of, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. He writes in there about the pain that we have, and he talks about we have a choice. We can either push against our pain, or we can welcome it and lean into it. And if I recall, the way he says it is something like lean into the white, hot coals of your pain and you will not find it bottomless. Doing so helps us to listen to our sadness. It honors our grief. And our questions change from why do I feel this way to what can I do with my pain so that it becomes meaningful and not just empty, pointless suffering? An Episcopal priest, now an instructor, Barbara Brown Taylor, she speaks directly to the pain that we feel, the struggle we have in grief, the sense of darkness that we feel, she says, when despite all my best efforts, the lights have gone off in my life, plunging me into the kind of darkness that turns my knees to water, I have not died. The monsters have not dragged me out of bed into their lair. Instead, I have learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light, things that have saved my life over and over again. So that there is really only one logical conclusion. I need darkness as much as I need light. Indeed, this waiting time of grief can teach us lessons if we are willing to learn. I was about 18 when I found this poem, and I've been carrying it around in my wallet ever since. It is written by Austrian poem Rainier Maria Rilke, whose life was a battle of depression and poor health. If you feel like it, would you read it with me? I beg you to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart, and try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without ever noticing it, live your way into the answer. For sure, this waiting time is not easy. We experience sleepless nights, unfamiliar emotions, and friends who do not understand. It takes focus and intention to remember that no matter what is happening around us, no matter how uncertain our life circumstances, or our future, right now, we are exactly where we need to be. 
right now we all have it in us to learn from this time and as much as we might like to move on we cannot hurry the process it will take as long as it takes even Paul, who had plenty of miseries and sorrow, reminds us to endure this time with hope. He's not commanding us to be happy, but he is pushing us to see beyond ourselves into the importance of our suffering. Be joyful. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction. Faithful in prayer. He understood that this Time teaches us to listen and watch and wait for our next best thing. Remember, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. We did not plan to be here like this. We did not expect to hurt like this. We may feel eons away from whatever incredible thing is waiting to be known. Still in this tottering time, this balance beam time of our life, when we are holding on to the door jams for dear life, God is present God with us, Emmanuel, is present, is here with us. This God that we worship and adore, our creator of heaven and earth is right here at this threshold, in this space, exactly where we need to be. Indeed, it is so. Amen.
The first candle we light is a way of remembering those whom we have loved who have died. We pause to remember their names, their faces, their voices, the memory that binds them to us in this season of expectation when all of creation waits for the light. Together we say, we remember them with love. May God's eternal love surround them. We light the second candle to redeem the pain of loss, loss of relationships, loss of trust, loss of jobs, loss of health, loss of faith, and loss of joy. We acknowledge and embrace the pain of the past, O oh God, and we offer it to you, asking that into our wounded hearts and open hands you will place the peace, the gift of peace, shalom, all of us. We remember that through you, all things are possible. Refresh, restore, renew us, O God, and lead us into your future. The third candle we light is to remember ourselves this Christmas time. We pause and remember these past weeks and months and for some of us years that have been heavy with our burdens. We lay before you the disbelief, the anger, the sadness, the hurt, the fear. We lay before you the ways we have fallen short and the times we have spent blaming ourselves and you, O oh God. And together we say, we remember that though winter be upon us and though the night be dark, dawn will come again and dawn defeats darkness. The fourth candle is lit to remember our faith, the gift of light and hope that God offers us in the story of Christmas, which began in a time of fear and uncertainty in a lonely stable where Emmanuel was found in the lowliest of circumstances. We remember that God who shares our life promises us comfort and peace. Let us remember the one who shares our burdens, who brings the truth, who bears the light, and who journeys with us all into our tomorrows. Sorry. In just a moment, as you feel comfortable, we're going to invite you to come forward and to light a candle. And as you do so, to name the loss. You can do so in silence. It's really important that we take time to name our losses. It's equally important to name our feelings. Wherever you are emotionally, God 
receives us, welcomes us, embraces us, loves us without judgment or condemnation. In a moment, I'll light the candles in the center of each sandbox. And then there are candles nearby. Take your time. This is a safe place to experience the healing grace and love of the Good Shepherd. Jesus Christ.
Shall we pray together? O Lord, we are ones who have walked in some form of darkness. It's troubling to us. And we need a great light. The light and love and life that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Heal broken hearts and draw near to those who are crushed in spirit as you've promised. Turn our mourning into gladness and give to us grace that we might give thanks in everything for this is the will of God that we might praise you for family and friends, for church services like this and for all that you provide for us, for all the strength that you've promised, for hope and comfort and peace, all that is ours through Jesus Christ in whose name we pray, amen. Follow me. Thank you for being with us today. Stay as long as you wish. You can stay seated. There will be CCMs and a pastor over there in prayer and if you decide to leave just exit in silence there are candles for you to take as you leave in memory of your loved ones that you can light during the advent season this god that we worship and adore can do far more than we can ever ask or imagine not by pushing us but by working within us right here, right now, and in days to come. In this confidence, go in peace and be witnesses to hope. Amen.